Hello, my name is Regina Galastian. I am a researcher at the Armenian Genocide Museum Institute. So first of all, I would like to greet the staff of uh, Red Lantern Analytica and also the Indian and international audience. I am very grateful that I am provided with this platform where I can address several issues of the history of the Armenian Genocide. So within 10, 15 minutes, I will be speaking about the context of the Armenian Genocide, the ideology of the ruling party, the methods, and also the results of the genocide. So for those that are not familiar with the history of the Armenians, at the end of 19th century, Armenians were divided in between two empires, Russian Empire and Ottoman Empire. And uh, we will be speaking only about the Western Armenia, about the Ottoman part, because genocide was perpetrated by the Turkish government in the Ottoman Empire. So at the turn of the 20th century, the Ottoman Empire straddled three continents and encompassed diversity among its almost 30 million population. While the state was Islamic, Christians were subordinated. So Christian and uh, Muslim in the Ottoman Empire were not considered equals and they were subordinated to the Muslim population of the empire. So for example, they didn't have right to bear arms, to serve in the army, uh, because you know only that was the Muslim capacity to defend the country, to bear the arms. And Christians were highly taxed. So generally it was a despotic monarchy, but uh, by the end of 19th century, European liberal ideas and philosophical and political thought began to penetrate into the Ottoman Empire. So several young men that were highly influenced with, for example, the French Revolution, they decided that changing of the regime in the Ottoman Empire would, first of all, uh, consolidate and keep the empire and also would bring some kind of equality to its old citizens. So uh, in 1889, they formed a political party, the name of which was Committee of Union and Progress. And of course, uh, those people whom we call Young Turks were, um, had the help of all the minorities of the empire. And at this moment, both the Christian and Arabic, uh, Muslim, Arabic and Albanians, because they believe that you know, constitution will end all the problems of the Ottoman Empire. So in 1908, they made a coup d'etat in the Ottoman Empire and um, they formed a parliament, they adopted the constitution. Uh, but what was interesting, one thing was to be an opposition party and to speak against the regime from Europe. And another thing was to become the ruling party, the government, the actual government of multi-ethnic, multi-religious empire. So from the first day of their governance, the Young Turks started the Turkification of the Ottoman Empire by legislation, by economic and educational reform, uh, step by step, after 1908, Armenians started to be marginalized in a state that was their own, in their own homeland. So they became the, you know, driven out of the economic and cultural life, cultural system, the whole system of the Ottoman Empire. So um, um, ideology of this Committee of Union and Progress was Turkish nationalism. Turkism, which was something new. The roots of Turkish ideology came from Europe. So they believed that at some point that was their own task to make this country into a nation state and into a state for Turks only. This was a radical ideology for, for multi-ethnic, I'm sorry, multi-ethnic empire. And um, uh, intertwined and connected with the historical and political developments of the Ottoman Empire, with the Balkan Wars, with the Muslim uprisings, Arabic and Albanian uprisings, with the cessation of the whole European uh, part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, this ideology had a crucial effect on the Armenians living in the Ottoman Empire because 
at some point when the government decided that the country is going to be only Turkish, Armenians who were having a strong national identity and living in the core of Turkish country in the Asia Minor Peninsula, which was considered as the heartland of Turkish uh, emerging nation state, they were starting to be seen as a threat. So uh, in the press, in the proper state propaganda, Armenians were portrayed as treacherous elements, as alliance. Um, some of the committee members who were doctors by their education started to call Armenians openly microbes, cancer living on the body of the empire. So they were claiming that as they were doctors, it was their duty to cut this cancer from the body of the empire and to save the real inhabitants, the Turks. So this was like the radical politics and radical ideology and also the loss of the territories, all these were combined together. And in the eve of the World War I, the idea that, you know, the former massacres and deportations of Armenians, it was not enough to, eat, to solve the existing Armenian national problem in the Ottoman Empire. So the young Turks had in mind the idea to kill each and every member of the Armenian community living in the Ottoman Empire, and if possible, even beyond its borders. So this was the idea of genocide. And what is needed for all the genocides to be committed? Of course, war. What is always a proper condition for such uh, international crimes. Uh, so uh, in 1914, when Ottoman Empire entered into the war on the side of Germany and Austria-Hungary, this was, you know, the green light for the Turkish government to start this, uh, let's say, demographic engineering of the country. So by the first stage of the Armenian genocide, all the Armenian able-bodied men were conscripted into the Turkish army under this motto of uh, the whole motherland is in danger, so we all have to go to the army and to save it. But after the first defeats, all the Armenian men were disarmed, labor battalions were formed out of Armenian men, and later they were all killed within the circle of the Ottoman army. So we believe that this was the first and huge blow to the Armenian community. By the second stage, all the Armenian intellectuals, high ranking parliament members, lawyers, uh, editors, professors of the university, and of course clergymen, they were all imprisoned and later killed. The culmination of this policy was April 24 of 1915. That's why Armenians all over the world, and not only Armenians, commemorate the Armenian genocide on April 24, because we believe that after this act, a proper resistance to the genocide would be not possible. And after this came the third stage, which was the deportation of the peaceful population. By the state law adopted in the parliament, uh, the name of law was the relocation law. Uh, all the Armenian population should be transferred into from the war zones into the Mesopotamian deserts which is today Syrian territory. So basically the Turkish officials were just knocking the doors of the Armenian citizens of the Ottoman Empire. They were saying that we are going to transfer you to a safer zone. Don't sell anything. The government will take hold of your property. After the war, you will come back and you will take your possessions back. And of course, in most of the cases, like Armenian women, they believed to this um, state order, they were just closing their doors, taking their keys with them, hugging their children and going to the road of deportation. So deportation in 1915, what was that? People were forced to march on the road, which took sometimes months or even more to the north and east of the country, like to walk and come to the south, to the deserts in the Syria without food, without water, exposed to the weather conditions. 
So they were dying hundreds and hundreds on the roads. And also, I would like to bring your attention to the fact that there were a lot of diseases in this period, and they didn't have epidemics, they didn't have any cure, like typhus. So they were just dying and dying and falling on the roads. But of course, they were attacked and killed by Kurdish detachments, by Turkish military, Turkish army, policemen, uh, and also special detachments, the main purpose of which uh, was just to make this, you know, killing process more effective. Despite all this condition, a lot of Armenians survived the road and they reached to the deserts of Syria. That's why in 1916, by a special order of the Minister of Interior, the cleansing of operations of the desert started as well. Also, special laws were given, laws and orders were given concerning the Armenians who converted to Islam prior to the genocide or some 20, 30 years before the genocide. Because by the order of the Minister of Interior, it runs as follows, that even a Muslim Armenian is still an Armenian, so they should be all gathered and killed as well. Uh, one thing that was very specific, uh, not so specific, but very um, part, let's say, a component of the Armenian genocide was the assimilation of the Armenian children. Uh, by special orders, the boys, Armenian boys under the age of five were gathered in the Turkish orphanages which were financed by the government. So in these orphanages, Armenian boys were renamed. They were forced to speak only Turkish. They were converted to Islam. So the vision of the government was to make a proper Turkish soldiers out of Armenian children. So what was the uh, outcome of the genocide? The methods, it was not only the physical destruction of Armenians from the, let's say, Turkish land, but also the assimilation of some portion of Armenian nation into the Turkish society. And one more thing is that parallel to the genocide, Armenian cultural heritage was destroyed as well. Monuments, churches, schools were burned, destroyed, or converted to Turkish mosques and used for another purposes. So generally, in the Ottoman of 1915, Armenian community in the Ottoman Empire was not operating anymore. But these cleansing operations um, from different regions and also gender-based um, elimination. It continued until 1923, when the Ottoman Empire was converted into a Turkish Republic. But this cultural eradication continued in, even in the Turkish Republic by the Turkish government. The geographical names of the places like different villages, valleys, mountains were renamed they got Turkish names, and the purpose of the Turkish government was not only physically to distract the Armenians from the Ottoman land, but also to show that, you know, to eradicate the traces of Armenians for, of the land, to show that there were no Armenians living there, and the land initially belonged to the Turks. So basically, we can admit that their state building plan actually succeeded. They have cleansed all the natives, and they form the nation state which operates till now. And also one more important thing, until now, the genocide of the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire uh, is uh, denied by the Turkish government. And what is painful, uh, it's not only the genocide that is denied, but also the existence of a once prosperous community in the Ottoman Empire that highly contributed into the cultural advance, into the education, into the, you know, um, prosperity of the country in general. So it's like denial of the Armenian existence in general in the Ottoman Empire. So this is it. I think I have managed 
to uh, address the issues um, within like 10, 12 minutes. So thank you for your attention and thank you one more time to Red Analytica uh, for providing me with this platform. Thank you so much.